They were mostly very typical families. At home, they felt secure. Home life was close and happy. He knew that they were being watched, but nothing could have prepared them fully for the events of that night. Anusha, you can finish this tomorrow. Okay, Papa. Проверка документов. Открывайте дверь. Что случилось, начальник? Ты проверь там. Ты останься здесь. Его сюда. Вы Тарасюк Николай? Да. С вами проживает Мария Павловна, Анна Михайловна, Иван и Настя Тарасюк. Да. В соответствии с решением советского правительства, вы и члены вашей семьи подлежите выселению в Сибирь. На вечное поселение за антисоветскую деятельность, как активные участники нелегальной секты свидетелей Иеговы. В вашем распоряжении два часа. Что мы сделали плохого против государства? У вас есть возможность остаться, если вы подпишете документ о прекращении всякой деятельности с сектой свидетелей Иеговы. Мы не можем этого сделать, начальник. Вам лучше быть выселенными? Мы не хотим быть выселены, но мы не можем отказаться от Бога тоже. Тогда у вас два часа. Обыщите дом. Встань, сядь там. Иголы позаботятся о нас. Не волнуйтесь. Иголы будут с нами. On three nights in April 1951, this scene was played out again and again throughout the Western Soviet Union. Thousands of Christian families, men, women and children, were loaded into boxcars and exiled to Siberia. This mass deportation marked a critical moment in a decades-long ideological attack on Jehovah's Witnesses, an attack that put their faith under trial. Today, Jehovah's Witnesses carry out their religious activities openly throughout the former Soviet Union. They preach freely, but it was not always so. They now hold large religious conventions. For much of the 20th century, however, the mighty Soviet government was bent on stamping out their organization. Why? How have the witnesses survived and prospered in former Soviet lands? To answer these questions, we need to take a brief look at the witnesses and their history.
The witnesses derive their name from the biblical name of God, Jehovah. By the late 19th century, Jehovah's Witnesses were already present in Russia. In 1913, imperial authorities recognized the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, authorizing them to publish literature and to conduct missionary activity inside the borders of the Russian Empire. However, even with such official authorization, the religious climate of the time was not favorable for such missionary work. Russia was an orthodox Christian clerical state. Naturally, that left little room for other religions in the spiritual sphere of society. A second group of religions was tolerated – Catholics, Baptists, Muslims and Buddhists. There was also a third group, the intolerable religions. They included practically any other religion. They were persecuted, spied on, and in general ruled by the authority of the police. Not many years after the Communist Revolution in 1917, the government's attitude toward all religion hardened. By 1940, the Soviet Union had expanded to include Western Ukraine, the Baltic countries and Moldavia, territories where many Jehovah's Witnesses lived. With this expansion, the Soviet Union suddenly acquired thousands more witness families. Then came World War II. Many Soviet citizens found themselves prisoners in Nazi camps where Jehovah's Witnesses had been imprisoned for their faith. Hundreds of Soviet prisoners accepted the Witnesses' beliefs. When the war ended, they returned home as Jehovah's Witnesses, further increasing their number in the country. But the end of the war did not mean peace for Jehovah's Witnesses. They believed that spiritual truth could come only from God. This was in direct conflict with the state, because the state was committed to a very different principle, as proclaimed by Lenin decades earlier. Any religious idea, any idea of any God at all, any flirtation with the idea of a God, is the most inexpressible foulness the most dangerous foulness, the most shameful infection. At that time, they believed there was only one true teaching – Marxism, Leninism. They had already written everything down. Therefore, it was necessary to battle with religion. After World War II, the witnesses came under stronger attack. Arrests increased dramatically. They questioned us to find out who directed the organization, who the older brothers were. I didn't answer them, so they beat me, that's all. Like this they beat me, here, here, all over. Every day it was repeated. It was 1947, and I was 19 years old. I and another witness were sent to the far north, to the Kaiski region. We were sentenced to five years imprisonment. It was truly awful at that time in the labor camps. There was anarchy, hunger, cold. When they arrested me in 1950, I was already five months pregnant. So, my little son was born in prison on August 13th. Security police documents show that from 1947 through 1950, 1,048 witnesses were arrested. Jehovah's Witnesses were in one of the worst positions in Ukraine and in the Soviet Union as a whole. 
pressure against the Orthodox Church or any other religious organization varied. But I think that the pressure on Jehovah's Witnesses was much more constant. But the arrests did not stop the witnesses as the authorities had hoped. They saw that arrests were not enough. They didn't arrest old ones and children. Even the children preached. So they decided to find a kind of punishment that would totally isolate Jehovah's Witnesses from society. On February 19, 1951, the head of the security police, Abba Kumov, presented a secret plan to Stalin. All of Jehovah's Witnesses, including infants and pregnant women, would be exiled. The plan was codenamed Operation North. Stalin approved it. Sometime in the morning at about 5 o'clock, the military men came to us, armed with machine guns and with guard dogs, and they presented documents to my parents, to my father, that stated that our family, as members of the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, was to be exiled to Siberia. They confiscated our Bible, the last Bible we had. I was worried and asked, Mama, are we the only ones they are taking away? Mother said, I don't know. Hundreds of witness families were trucked to train stations throughout the western regions. The trucks came in with their load. Here is where they came in. But the freight cars were over there. The first and second trucks drove to a freight car. One of our sisters was pregnant, and the officer insulted her. He called her names, laughed at her. And that is how it continued. As they filled the boxcars, they closed the doors. And again, and again. The witnesses were torn from homes and farms that had belonged to parents and grandparents for generations. They were leaving rich fields and orchards for the harsh isolation of Siberia. It was a difficult time for my parents. Siberia at that time was really a scary place and there were many problems. In the course of Russia's history, millions of people were exiled to Siberia on a wide variety of charges. But only Jehovah's Witnesses were banished wholesale as a religious group. Interestingly, the Witnesses were offered a way to avoid deportation. The man in charge of the deportation of our family was good-hearted. For quite a while he tried to persuade Father to sign a paper renouncing the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. Few witnesses, if any, accepted this offer. Since the conversation did not bring the desired results, the officer said, all right, of course, now we have to deport you. All, the whole population of Jehovah's Witnesses from the Ukraine, Moldavia and the Baltics were sent out at the same time. Everybody was taken together. They were given a couple of hours to pack their things and they were put in freight cars and taken for a very long trip to Siberia. There could be more than 40 people in here. Here was a stove on which we tried to cook. For half of the trip they didn't feed us anything at all. We shared. Maybe something could be warmed up. The brothers set up a toilet this way. There was a hole in the corner. They inserted a bucket, and that was all the comfort one could have in these conditions. For 20 days, the 
trains made their way thousands of miles through mountains and prairies, day after day, night after night. But in spite of all of this, our brothers and sisters maintained good spirits. They encouraged one another. Well, you can't say that there were constantly smiles on our faces, but there wasn't any fear. The witnesses' strong spirit not only enabled them to encourage one another, but also surprised their captors. They were always amazed that we sang songs. They would say, why are you so calm? Who are you? Are they taking you to a health resort? Where are they taking you that you're so calm? And when we stopped singing, the guards would come and say, well, why did you stop singing? Sing some more. Just knowing that there were witnesses in nearby trains lifted their spirits. At first, we heard singing only in our car, but later, when other trains passed, we realized that there were brothers on those trains too. We could hear them singing. We saw another train passing us. It bore a poster saying Jehovah's Witnesses. Then we, the three of us teenagers, quickly wrote our own poster and we hung it outside. The people were strong. They were strong in spirit. That pregnant sister gave birth in the boxcar. They came to count us and said, look here, it's another Jehovah's Witness. The long trip from the western regions would eventually come to an end. Once in Siberia, the witnesses were dropped off at settlements along the rail lines. Here they were told that they would spend the rest of their lives. Local authorities were to provide them with housing, but in no case was it adequate. At first, we had to live in tents. There, my first son caught a cold, then got meningitis. Finally, he died. A year later, another son was born. But my wife had trouble during birth. She needed surgery immediately. They did the surgery, but something went wrong. She suffered for a year, then she died. Eventually, they took us to a place that had been a prison. It was terrible, filled with bugs and roaches. In Ukraine, we had never seen bad bugs or roaches. The majority of the witnesses, men and women as young as 15, were forced to cut trees for scant wages. Logging in the Siberian winter was brutal. In minutes, ears could become frostbitten. It was cold, 40, 42, even down to 50 degrees below zero Celsius. Well, this was very difficult work. With warmer weather came other miseries. In the daytime, there were many flies, the type that bite, and they would go everywhere, into your mouth, you could not even open your mouth, into your ears, so our faces became so swollen that we could not recognize one another. I wondered if there would ever be a time when I could freely look up at the sky. We recall the time when the Israelites lived in Egypt and how they were forced to work. We prayed, God, make our faith stronger so that this work, which is beyond our strength, will not shake us. Congregations of witnesses continued to meet for Bible study, despite strict surveillance. We always valued our meetings because they gave us strength, vigor. Of course, meetings were banned, but we never stopped having them, regardless of what the situation was. Under extremely strict conditions, 
five or seven people would meet together at night or at six o'clock in the morning. Interestingly, there was one dog in the village, and he knew everyone there and only barked at strangers. So when the police commandant appeared at the very edge of the village, the dog began to bark, and we knew to hide everything. Stalin's death in 1953 brought hope of relief. But relief would be a long time in coming. The new regime went on in the same course. They arrested and sentenced us. Some they gave 15 years, me 12, others 10. Most arrested witnesses were sentenced to labor camps. There they lost the limited freedom they had known in deportation. In court they could not expect a fair trial. Guilty verdicts had already been decided upon. Ten-year sentences were handed down without any basis. The clerks would come out in tears because they saw the injustice, but could do nothing about it. For us, this was touching. The security police had already given orders. The court didn't even examine the case. The labor camp system was referred to as the main administration of camps, abbreviated in Russian as Gulag. Millions perished in these camps from overwork, exposure, and lack of food. Hard experiences in the camps moved many prisoners to listen to the witnesses' message of hope. This led some to become witnesses themselves. Fyodor Stepanov was one such person. He experienced the hunger and cold. Daily he saw dead bodies being removed from the camp. One day, he met a witness. I said in the conversation, faith has existed for so long, but it hasn't helped anybody. There is no right faith. But he said, there is such a faith, there is such a truth. And then he told me what is in the Bible. Meanwhile, Antonina Fieskova had also become a witness in a nearby women's camp. One day, she was asked to pick up some underground literature from a witness coming from the men's camp. She only knew that his name was Fyodor. My heart started pounding, and I thought, what a nice young man he is. I looked, and Fyodor came to the gate. He just shook hands with me, passing the literature into my hand. We smiled at each other, and didn't say anything special. Fyodor and Antonina began to correspond through the witnesses' underground channels. And when I was released, I waited two years for him. Then he came, and we were married. Well, the five months with him flew by like five minutes. Then Fyodor was again incarcerated for possessing witness literature. As is evident in anti-witness propaganda films, the officially atheistic authorities put forth a special effort to suppress the witnesses' Bible literature. Many had been arrested for distributing such literature, which was falsely labeled political in nature. People lived here, and they were citizens of this country but they did not really have the opportunity to freely express their own religious opinions. They could not freely satisfy their own religious needs. Therefore, in this sense, they lived in an internal foreign country. Jehovah's Witnesses also shared this fate. The Witnesses, initially those few who had avoided deportation, built numerous underground bunkers, in order to produce literature without interference. People might ask, what motivated you to live underground? Precisely, it was the regime that existed on the surface that motivated me to go underground. At first, they made copies by transferring them from a hand-inked original. But the demand for Bible literature was growing. 
so they began printing with stencils and machines. More people became Jehovah's Witnesses, and there were many new congregations. We had to supply literature not only to Ukraine and Moldavia, but also to those in Siberia. When the oxygen in the tiny bunker got low, Nikolai rested until more fresh air seeped in. True, it was not easy work. For seven days or more, I didn't go outside at all. But in the bunker, I felt free. The authorities were relentless in their quest to discover the sources of the witnesses' literature. In Siberia, the security police once searched Anya Vovchuk's home from 7 in the morning until 11.20 at night, digging up the ground under the bedroom and probing the soil in the garden. We had two typewriters at home that they didn't find. They were hidden in a pig stall, and there we had a very, very big pig. He was not aggressive with us, but if someone he didn't know came, he was aggressive. And he just stood there and snorted at the policeman. They told mother, hold back that pig. Mother said, he's not a kitten that I can hold in my arms. How can I hold him back? And they did not go into that stall to check it. So we were left with the two typewriters. We viewed them as ordinary people doing their job. Sometimes, during the searches, when they would uncover something and no one was around, the policeman would chuckle and tell us that we should have hidden this or that in a safer place, and then he would leave. Why were the witnesses willing to risk their freedom, even their lives, for the sake of their literature? It was because the literature sustained their faith in God. It nourished their hope that God would bring about a new world, free from suffering and death. For the witnesses, being deprived of the Bible and Bible literature was like being deprived of food. From the moment a baby is born, no one has to teach him how to nurse at his mother's breast. He smells the milk and he takes action to satisfy his physical needs. Our Creator implanted in us exactly the same spiritual needs, and all of us have these needs. But underground printing was dangerous, especially during the 1950s. As the police were closing in on one printing location, Nikolai Dubovinsky sought to escape through a window. As I approached the window, the policeman was already standing there. I turned around and went out a different window and headed down the road. They came out of the house and began to pursue me, and then they began shooting. They wounded me but only in my hand. Then they ran out of bullets. So I got away again. Later, however, Nikolai was arrested and sentenced to death. His sentence was afterwards commuted to 25 years in the Gulag. Stalin's eventual successor, Nikita Khrushchev, made notable reforms. He dismantled much of the Gulag penal system and curtailed the authority of the security police. But he continued the attack on Jehovah's Witnesses. It is difficult to explain the anti-religion period of Khrushchev. We call that historical period the Khrushchev thaw. But in regard to religion, it was typically a frost, if not an outright freezing. Under the Khrushchev administration, special re-education camps were set up, designed to turn inmates from their beliefs. In 1960, hundreds of witnesses, men and women, were put into such camps near Saransk. Veterans of these camps recount their experiences to younger witnesses. Why did they do this? To coordinate their ideological war against us. And they studied the effect on us, whether we would gradually yield to this re-education or not. Almost every weekend some Gulag official came to see us and tried to pressure us, to persuade us. They were sowing seeds of doubt and distrust. 
to shake the brothers and sisters' faith. At times, the pressure included being denied the right to correspond with family members. I had not received a letter for two years. And suddenly I got a letter, my wife and child are coming to visit. I had never seen my son because he was born after I had left. The officer said, Nikolai, here is the paper and pen, we are not asking anything of you. You will be reunited with your wife and you will be free. Sign it. I said, I will never do that. Are you ready to serve your entire term and then another one after that? Yes, to the very death. Basically, they were trying to buy you off with your own wife, or they would offer you money, an apartment in Moscow, a car or whatever. Mountains of gold, if you would just sign that paper. The paper was a renunciation of your faith. The camp seemed impenetrable, and searches were made often, but still the witnesses received their literature. The KGB called me in and said, how did you manage to get the watchtower here in the camp through 13 rows of barbed wire in just three months? How do you do it? How do you get your watchtower? Witness prisoners obtained literature with the help of outsiders, both witnesses and others, who visited the camps. The witnesses then hand-copied it, including the entire Bible and their principal magazine, The Watchtower. But Ravliuk did not reveal this secret. I said, Officer, do you believe what the Bible says about how a raven fed Jehovah's prophet? I read it. I know about that. Do you believe it? Well, what can I say? I don't know. Maybe it really did happen. Then why don't you believe that the same raven could bring the watchtower to us in this camp? Of course, he didn't believe that. So I don't know of a single instance where anyone complained that there was no literature. For that we can only thank Jehovah. The most important date for the witnesses was the annual memorial of the death of Christ, which they observed by passing unleavened bread and wine. Though camp authorities tried to prevent it, the witnesses celebrated the memorial faithfully. In 1961, over 300 witnesses met in a camp dining hall after hours. We sat and talked and laughed, so as not to give the appearance that the day was special for us. We had some flat bread that we made in the camp. I don't know which brother obtained the wine. The table was big, and the brothers who gave the talks sat on one side of it. It was such a spiritually strengthening experience. Just as they were concluding, an informer discovered them. Nikolai and other suspected witness leaders were sent from the labor camp to a cramped prison cell where their already meager food rations were further reduced. Viktor Gutschmidt was another witness who was torn from his family because of his faith and found himself in the re-education camps. My husband said to me as he was leaving, now you will be the man and the woman, papa and mama. He kissed me and left. He was gone for a full ten years. Despite almost constant illness during his imprisonment, Victor continued to build up his family. He sent them encouraging letters, along with postcards that he had drawn himself. He wrote to each of us, to mama, to each daughter, a story or an interesting experience from nature or some discovery he had read about in a science magazine. By means of these cards, Victor carried on in his role as father, educating and disciplining his children. Since I myself had learned the truth, I saw that it's the right way for people to go. I wanted my children to walk in the same way of the truth. Dear little Iriska and Yulusa, learn what is just, good and human. May your childhood be full of love, 
You must remain true to yourselves, know how to observe nature and discover truth and beauty. In that way, a person learns to love, to think. Camp census did not permit him to write or draw anything about God, but his wife and family understood the meaning of his letters. As soon as we received these postcards, we immediately connected them with Bible subjects. For instance, when they included the beauty of nature, forests, rivers, I immediately read Isaiah chapter 65, such a beautiful earth, and they loved God very much from early childhood. Mama would then pray with us, and we would cry. Well, of course, these cards played a big role in our upbringing. The attempt to re-educate the witnesses failed. The camps were eventually disbanded, most witnesses were released, and Viktor Gutschmidt was reunited with his family. Tribulation and persecution only strengthen a person's spiritual life. So stories about persecution and about the people who went into the camps because of their faith, and many of Jehovah's Witnesses ended up in these camps, only aroused respect in me. A person suffered for his faith. This aroused only respect and recognition. By the early 1960s, Many deported witnesses could move into better homes, but the government maintained constant ideological pressure on them. Witness parents were prohibited from teaching their beliefs to their own children. Fyodor Zhitnikov was taken from his parents on those grounds. My younger brother Vladimir and I were taken by force to an orphanage. A detachment of police came and took us. Clearly, the objective of all of this was to scare us, to destroy our faith, so that we would stop serving God. The authorities had come to realize that they could not re-educate adult witnesses. But they still tried to win over witness children through indoctrination. After Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin made the world's first orbital space flight in 1961, Soviet television broadcast many programs on atheistic themes. The fact that Gagarin did not see any God was presented as proof that God does not exist. The principal called me in and said, So you see, Vasily, now you can't go anywhere to find God. There is no God. Gagarin flew all over and he didn't find anything, he didn't see him. I asked, Sergei Evgenievich, how do you imagine God to be? Do you think he is like you, sitting behind a desk in an office, like a human we can see and touch? Although witnesses might have had excellent scholastic records, they were allowed only the most basic education. A witness could not be a teacher or be in charge of cultural or educational activities. He could only do physical work. For two years I tried to enter some kind of college or technical institute. But regardless of how many exams I passed, I was not accepted. In the end, one older man from the examining board came around the corner, took me aside and said, Go and get a job, young man. Nobody is going to accept you into any school with the kind of record you have. After Leonid Brezhnev became Communist Party leader in 1964, arrests of witnesses became infrequent. The next year, the sentences of permanent exile were rescinded. Witnesses could now leave Siberia if they wished. I had the opportunity to go back to Ukraine, but I said we'll stay here because we are needed here. Others decided to return, but their KGB reports followed them. I had already moved several times. I had been in Kazakhstan, I had been in Georgia, 
and I could not get set up anywhere. If they just found out that you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses, they said, get out of town. When the KGB called me in, I told them that I had no place to go. I can't leave. I have a mother. My father is elderly. They cannot work. Ivan Mikitkov continued his activities underground in Ukraine for 15 years, until he was again imprisoned for his faith. In the meantime, the authorities focused their efforts on other types of pressure. School teachers were called on to persuade their students to abandon religious faith. It meant that we needed to seek out the sectarian and show him that our socialist reality was so wonderful that he needed to leave all these dilapidated dogmas and join the ranks of communist builders. During this period, propaganda films designed to discredit Jehovah's Witnesses were distributed throughout the USSR. Slava, Isusu. Скажите народам, Егова царствует. An image of these people was developed, antisocial, miserable, aggressive, maybe not even psychologically normal. Basically, they had no place in society. Whoever has studied persecution in the past has seen that in one way or another, persecution is always built on a lie. The victim is slandered. He must be presented in a way that stirs up prejudice in society. That way society will be on the persecutor's side. Besides using propaganda, for many years the KGB recruited informers to infiltrate witness congregations. For instance, in 1968 the KGB district director offered Nikolai Bwitchkov an assignment. He requested me to spy on Jehovah's Witnesses. I was asked to find some of their literature and give it to the KGB. Eventually, hundreds of witnesses were printing literature underground. Levko Batich, for example, built his own offset press. Of course, the fear was, what if they catch me? But I didn't think about the consequences much. I hoped that everything would be okay, that Jehovah would bless the work, and that's what happened. The literature had a powerful effect. One witness booklet that compared the teaching of evolution with the Bible changed the KGB informer's viewpoint. No one could answer that question, how life appeared how the universe appeared. And here I am finding a solution. In the Bible I could find answers to those disturbing questions. At the same time I was working for the KGB. I needed to find a way out, because a person cannot ride in two boats at the same time. Witness meetings were a main target of the KGB. But Bwitchkov reported to his KGB director that he had been unable to find any. Since I couldn't carry out that task, the last time we met, he told me I wasn't suitable for the work. I was so happy because they themselves took me off their list of informers. But greater trouble lay ahead. In 1980, the authorities orchestrated an intense campaign through the mass media to discredit responsible witnesses. In Kparovsk in 1984, Nikolai Bwitchkov, now a baptized witness, and several fellow believers, were accused of anti-Soviet activities. Wyshkov was charged with taking his sons to Christian meetings and teaching them the Bible. Why? 
по очень простой причине, что наша организация, она считается запрещенной в Советском Союзе. Так. И мы вынуждены находиться здесь на нелегальном положении. Брали ли вы на собрание детей своих? Водили? Я считаю, что здесь родители решают этот вопрос. Водить им на собрание своих детей или нет? Так вот, я еще раз спрашиваю. Принимали ли участие в собраниях, тем более незаконных собраниях, несовершеннолетние? Закон Бога, он гласит о том... Речь идет не о нарушении божественных законов, а давайте о нарушении законов наших. Пуичков был сентен на три года, но все-таки атака на свидетельство веры бахфирует на преследователей. In Germany and in Soviet times, they thought that you could get rid of an idea by using extreme violence. But it turned out that when an idea is strong, it makes people strong. So the outcome was just the opposite of what was expected. In particular, where Jehovah's Witnesses were exiled, turned out to be the perfect breeding ground for new supporters. On the local radio, they used to say, these older ones, they will die off by themselves. But this younger generation will never believe in God. Never. Well, we see that our grandparents and parents have already died. But we continue on, along with our children and grandchildren. Eventually, many in the government came to realize that the witnesses were not subversive or political. Professor Nikolai Gordienko explains what Soviet authorities concluded from their investigations of Jehovah's Witnesses. It is a specific form of Christianity. It is completely legitimate. The specific character of this religion is its Bible orientation. It consistently tries to follow the concept that the Bible is the only authority. Research in general confirmed that Jehovah's Witnesses are a Russian organization. They are an association of Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians and Moldavians. The 4,000 Witnesses in the Soviet Union in 1946 doubled in number by 1950. By 1985, when Mikhail Gorbachev became Communist Party head, their number was approaching 30,000. Gorbachev's policy of perestroika led to greatly increased freedoms across the Soviet Union. In 1989, a long withheld privilege was granted to the witnesses. Large numbers were permitted to leave the country to attend conventions with their fellow believers elsewhere. We had only heard that there were conventions. We didn't even dream of going. And all of a sudden we were going to the convention in Warsaw, Poland. I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, Fyodor, until we get to Warsaw, I won't believe that such freedom has opened up. When we came in, I looked. It was like a river, a river of people flowing toward the stadium. As soon as the music began to play, I started to cry. In March 1991, Jehovah's Witnesses were legally registered in Russia. That summer saw the first series of conventions inside the Soviet Union. In former times, whenever our brothers were in the company of the police, it was when they were being arrested. But now, the police were escorting 11 busloads from Irkutsk, bearing the banner, Jehovah's Witnesses Convention. Long-time witnesses such as Konstantin Skripchuk, who spent 23 years in confinement for his faith, especially appreciated these changes. Skripchuk and other imprisoned witnesses were completely exonerated. They received documents of rehabilitation, giving them benefits similar to war veterans. A KGB officer decided that he wanted to speak with me one more time. He said, for all that Soviet rule did to you, you should hate it to the core, but I don't see that in you. 
Please tell me, how is that possible? I said, it is totally possible. If I hated the government, or even opposed it somehow, then I would not be a Christian. Siberia is no longer the forbidding place it once was. With development, life has become less challenging. Irkutsk, Siberia is now a bustling modern city. Today, more than 300,000 of Jehovah's Witnesses carry on their spiritual activity in all the countries of the former Soviet Union. The headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia is located near St. Petersburg. For the Witnesses who had to operate underground, having their own center open to the public is a dream come true. In many ways, life is more normal now for Jehovah's Witnesses. They are grateful to enjoy their family life and worship in freedom. Their hard experiences have strengthened their faith. Nowadays, thinking about what I've gone through, I cannot imagine that I could have done it in my own strength. A Bible prophecy says, they will be certain to fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. I am thankful to Jehovah that He does not leave His people. My heart is full of joy. It almost doesn't fit inside my chest when I think for what I suffered, for what I was punished, that I tried to do the will of Jehovah. I think it is frightening only if you've never faced difficulties. But once you face them, you know that special strength. When we rely on Jehovah, we ask for His guidance, we ask for His help. We will always get it. Jehovah's Witnesses look to the future with the same faith as they have shown in the past. In their view, it was this faith that brought them through their trials.